On behalf of the crew of the USS Hornet, welcome aboard. We have produced this video to provide an opportunity for you to experience a little of what life was like aboard a carrier and to give you some of the history surrounding this famous ship. We're standing on the ship's quarterdeck where many activities occurred when the ship was active, such as ship ceremonies and where dignitaries would also be welcomed aboard at this location. The bronze pl plaques that you are viewing were donated to the ship by the USS Hornet Club. The Hornet Club's membership includes crew members from the CV-8 and the CV-12 Hornet, as well as many non-crew members that have joined. The memorial plaque is dedicated to the brave and courageous men who served on the USS Hornet during times of war and peace. Above all, this plaque is to memorialize the ship's company and airmen who made the supreme sacrifice. This ship, the CV-12, is named in honor of the CV-8, which was sunk at the Battle of Santa Cruz Islands in October 1942. The CV-8 Hornet is the carrier that transported General Doolittle and the 16 B-25 bombers for the attack on Japan in 1942. This is the original ship's bell installed just prior to commissioning on November 29th, 1943. From here, we'll enter the hangar deck and proceed to the replica of the USS Hornet CB-12 scoreboard. This scoreboard was handmade and donated to the Hornet by Eric Phillips, a volunteer aboard the ship. The rising sun flags represent the airplanes shot down by airmen of the Hornet during World War II, a total of 659, and includes nine planes shot down during direct attacks on the Hornet by the ship's guns, making a total of 668. An additional 742 were destroyed on the ground a grand total of 1,410 planes. The Hornet has the distinction of destroying more aircraft than any other carrier in World War II. The silhouette and the type of ships that were sunk by the Hornet's aircraft are, the ones with the rising sun symbol flag represents warships and one is a CV, a Japanese carrier. There were 42 AK Japanese cargo ships identified with the white flag with the red sun symbol. One CL, a Japanese light cruiser. 10 DD Japanese destroyers. And planes for the Hornet were the first to attack the Japanese battleship Yamoto. She was the last one of two that were the largest battleships ever built. They carried nine 18-inch guns. The largest guns our battleships carried were 16-inch guns. The ribbon on the upper left corner was for the Asiatic Pacific Campaign, and the ribbon on the upper right represents the Philippine Liberation Ribbon. Just forward of the quarterdeck is the ladder that leads to the captain's stateroom. And as you can see, the last captain we had aboard was Captain C.J. Sieberlich. And he commanded the ship until its decommissioning in 1970. We pan across the hangar deck to the port side. Just above the helicopter, you can see a stainless steel ladder. That's the one that goes up to the Admiral's stateroom. Both staterooms butt against each other, and they're on the O2 level. The area where you're at now is the orientation area, and this is where the public would be seated so that they can view a videotape that will describe the ships that were named the Hornet in past years. This is the eighth ship named the Hornet, the first one was 
named in 1775 during the Revolutionary War. As we proceed forward, uh, one of the interesting aspects we have here is a map that was drawn and it commemorates the end of World War II. On it, it shows all of the naval engagements that occurred in the South Pacific and it indicates the names of all of the ships that were sunk and how they were sunk either by bombs or by torpedoes. The names include all of the American naval craft, the British, the Australian, and the Japanese naval ships that were sunk during that period of time. All the printing is quite small, so we have an, a magnifying glass for people that they can hold it up so they can read those names to determine which ships they are. now are the controls for the number one elevator and this elevator is located in the forward part of the ship and it is used to lower aircraft after they have landed on the stern and then taxied forward. And taxiing forward the planes will fold their wings back or up de depending on the type of aircraft that it is. When it gets to this elevator they're lowered down to the hangar deck and from here they are moved by units called mules or tugs because there are no engines that are run on this hangar deck because of the danger to the crew. In the later years when the jets came into being with jet engines running down here that the intake area of the jet could actually suck people into the intake so they were very dangerous to run aircraft engines down here and it was never done. This gives you a view of how big the hangar deck is from the forward portion of the elevator you just viewed to way at the back end of the ship or the stern end that is 720 feet away. The width of the hangar deck averages 70 feet. Some areas of course are wider, some are narrower. The deck itself is constructed of two inch and a quarter plates that are welded together and it constitutes an armor plated deck that was designed to withstand a 500 pound armor piercing bomb and also withstand a 1,000 pound general purpose bomb. In World War II, of the 16 Essex class carriers, of which the Hornet is one of, that operated in the South Pacific during World War II, there was never a bomb that penetrated these decks. Speaks well of the design for that period of time. As we proceed down the hangar deck, we'll talk about various aspects of this portion of the ship and explain to you in some cases how it functions. This is a photo of the Grumman F-14A Tomcat and this is an aircraft that the Navy has given to us to show in our museum on the Hornet. This is actually a flyable airplane. We've had it for about three months at the present time. This is one of the fastest planes in the world. It can carry both missiles and bombs, and it also has a uh, Gatling gun aboard that is used for self-defense when the Sidewinder missiles have all been depleted. The uh, length of this plane from the nose to the tail is 68 feet. And when it's loaded with its fuel, two officers, a pilot and a radar intercept officer. It weighs 68,000 pounds. You can see it has two engines. The wings are designed in such a way that at low altitudes the wings are opened up for maximum lift. As the plane gains altitude, the wings fold back for additional speed and it causes less air resistance. This is a HUP and this is a helicopter that actually flew off of the Hornet. And it was built in 1948 and it's obviously the older styles but uh, it's been partially restored by the air group that works aboard the ship as a volunteer group and we can pan for the length of it so you can get some concept of what it looked like.
What you're looking at right now is a five inch ammunition hoist. This hoist is used to lower ammunition out of the magazines when they bring ammunition aboard from a replenishment ship. If we follow over here to the unit that's painted green, that's a fog foam nozzle. What that is used for is to put out oil or gasoline fires. The fog foam is produced down in the second deck and then pumped up here. All of the fire equipment that's painted green uses fog foam. Any of the equipment aboard that's painted red, that is seawater that's being pumped aboard to fight flammable parts of fire such as paint, materials that are not related to gasoline or to oil. Up here are some gray painted cabinets. These cabinets were, are where life jackets are stored. By pulling down on this lanyard, the bottom of that drops open and the life jackets fall down to the deck. The reason for storing them there is if there's a need for life jackets, the crew is given the word to abandon ship, for example. They'll come over here and open the bottom of that. Everyone will get a life jacket. And the reason they don't wear life jackets on the hangar deck is because they're too bulky and cumbersome to, pro to do the work that's required down here. The red and yellow checkers that you see over there, that identifies that as part of the fire door system. Before we get into how the fire doors work, we need to know that the hangar deck is made up of three sections. It consists of bay one, which is in the forward part of the ship, bay two is a midship, and bay three is the after part of the ship, and it's down there where that gray aircraft is at, it's a gray crusader. We'll talk about that later. But the purpose for the fire doors it was a design that was developed after World War II because of the fires they had aboard carriers. This design was adopted to help protect this area from fires. What it's used for is if there's a fire in Bay 1, and that's where we're standing, that the fire doors would be closed. And what that would accomplish, it would isolate the fire up in Bay 1 of the ship and not allow it to spread to the midships or to the after part of the ships. If the fire occurred in Bay 2, the mid, where it's midships, that both fire doors would be closed, the one that separates Bay 3 from Bay 2, and it would close the door at Bay 1, and that, that would isolate the fire at midships in Bay 2, and it wouldn't be allowed to spread throughout the ship. The system after the doors are closed is cooled down from a sprinkler system which is in the overhead and you possibly you can see where that laser light is pointing them out. So what they are are flattened nozzles and they're on both sides of the doors and when the doors are closed water is pumped through there and it's sprayed down on both sides which creates a water curtain. That prevents the doors from buckling from the heat that's encountered during a fire. The area that you're seeing over here is a fire station. There's one of those in each bay. During any air operations or any repairs or loading of aircraft on these decks, the fire stations will be manned by crewmen. They are watching through those window slots and they can identify where a fire is starting to occur. They can immediately sound the alarm and start firefighting practices and one of those would be the closure of the fire doors separating other parts of the ship from the bays in which the fire is at. You're visualizing here is the uh, refueling station. Currently you can see that the pipes are painted a lavender color. That means that that is a refueling station for jet fuel. In periods of time, especially during World War II, those would have been painted yellow, signifying it was 100 octane aviation gas. This would be where planes would be refueled as they are brought down to the hangar deck from the flight deck. They could also be rebombed and ammunition placed aboard. That operation was done in two areas, both on the hangar deck as well as the flight deck. This is the ship's store where 
any of you that are aboard would have the opportunity to purchase uh, an item that you felt would be worthwhile to take home to remember the Hornet and your visit aboard the ship. This is the uh, FJ-2 Fury, and this is the Navy's version of the Air Force's Sabre Jet. And it was used in a period of time of the Korean War, one of the early jets that flew off of carriers and uh, actually flew off of the Hornet. This is a UH-34 Seahorse helicopter. It was used in Vietnam, flown by Marines, and used to carry troops and as a medevac helicopter. It carried 12 Marines fully equipped and it could carry four litters with wounded troops being taken out of a combat zone. This is the number two elevator and this is the elevator that is at the very end of the angle flight deck. This is the elevator that the astronauts were lowered down from the flight deck to the hangar deck after they were picked up in, from the ocean and brought aboard the ship. The astronauts were still in their self-contained suits, which captured all the air that they breathed. You may recall there, there was some fear that upon their return to Earth, they would be contaminated by some unknown disease from the moon. The helicopter was towed to this area where the astronauts stepped down to the deck and these footprints represent their first steps back on Earth. The three astronauts then entered the quarantine trailer. This one was for Apollo 14. The original used for Apollo 11 is at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. In the trailer, they were met by the engineer that designed the trailer and a flight surgeon, making a total of five men. The astronauts were given blood and urine tests, which were passed out to the recovery team. President Nixon gave his welcome back to Earth speech here. They were kept in a quarantine trailer at sea for three days and were monitored to determine if they became sick. They arrived at Pearl Harbor and the trailer was unloaded from elevator number three to the pier on a flatbed truck. And the trailer was hauled with the five men in it to Hickam Air Base at Pearl Harbor, where the trailer was loaded into a C-141 aircraft and flown for nine hours to Ellis Air Force Base in Texas. The trailer was moved to Johnson Space Center, where it was put in a building that was designed for the quarantine period. The five men left the trailer and spent 14 more days in the quarantine facilities for a total of 21 days in quarantine. The quarantine trailer and building were designed to filter and sterilize all air going into and out, as well as all refuse, so no one would be exposed to the germs that may have been brought back from the moon. After making certain they were not contaminated, they were given a ticker tape parade in New York City and then a world tour. The information that's showing on the video now is related to the training capsule that you see here. And that capsule was going to be used for Apollo 18. Apollo 17 was the last one that flew to the moon, or returned from the moon. And this was used as a training capsule. It did never, never had the heat shield placed on the bottom of it. What they would do is drop this out in the ocean, and it would be sealed. And astronauts in training would be inside and they would open the door and the helicopter would pick them up and simulate a pickup from a capsule that had returned from the moon. Those of you that uh, may have seen the movie Apollo 13, this is the capsule that they used in that film. And you might recall, if you looked in that opening there with Tom Hanks sitting in the middle with two other stars. This small enclosed area that you're looking at now is where the hangar deck control officer was located. His responsibility was to make certain that the aircraft were stored on the hangar deck properly. And the greatest thing that his accomplishment would be would be to store as many planes on this deck as possible. He had a layout board in that area in his office and small 
models of aircraft representing those that would be stored on this deck. He would place those models so that he could get as many planes as possible and they would be positioned by the people with the tugs moving the aircraft about. This is a plank owner's wall and the names of the original donors who helped fund the Hornet Foundation and to save the ship from the salvagers so that the museum could become a reality and all their names are posted here. This is elevator number three and it's capable of folding up inward as well as lifting planes and cargo from the hangar deck to the flight deck. The elevator would be folded up while replenishing or refueling at sea or when passing through a narrow passageway such as the Panama Canal. Originally, the number three elevator was located amidships in Bay 3, and it was changed to the present location when the angled deck was installed. This is the F-8U Crusader, a Vietnam War combat plane. This type of plane never took off or landed aboard the Hornet because the catapults and arresting gear aboard this ship were never upgraded to handle the weight of this aircraft. The Crusader did take off and land on other Essex-class carriers, which were sister ships to the Hornet. The flight simulator experienced the thrill of a catapult shot, a strike in desert storm, an aerial dogfight, and a successful emergency landing aboard a carrier. The audio is an actual communication between Desert Storm fighter pilots. This is not a real cockpit, but rather an amusement ride that can hold up to 10 to 12 persons, and a fee is charged. This is a TBM Avenger. This type of aircraft was our best torpedo plane during World War II. It carried a crew of three, a pilot, a radio man, and a turret gunner. The plane was also capable of carrying bombs as well as torpedoes. Later on, rockets were added to its ordnance carrying capabilities. The plane on their hangar deck was actually assigned to the Hornet during the war. This aircraft the one like this is the one that uh, our former president, George Bush, flew in World War II, and he was shot down off Iwo Jima in 1945. He was the only survivor out of the group of three people aboard. That is a outline of the torpedo hatch that is opened up and through that opening they will raise a torpedo up and the torpedo that they would raise up would look like this one over here that's on the deck it's a mark 13 and this is the type of torpedo that the tbm avenger carried when it was fighting during world war ii now are a group of patches that represent the various carriers that the Hornet operated with in the South Pacific during World War II. One of the interesting things that, about these patches is that they were all handmade and painted by the same volunteer, Eric Phillips, that did the scoreboard that we viewed at the very beginning of the tape. The patch that you're looking at now represents the heritage of excellence of the USS Hornet, the CVS-12. The C stands for carrier, V stands for heavier than air, which represent the aircraft aboard. The S represents anti-submarine warfare carrier, and that was a designation of this ship when it was decommissioned in 1970. The group of ships in the center of it cover the period of time from 1775 to 1970. 
those are the ships that were named the Hornet. The one in 1941 at the very bottom, that was the CV-8, and as you recall, that's the one that was sunk in the Battle of Santa Cruz Islands in 1942. The remainder were those that you see here with the Hornet represented in the very center of it. Gun spots are for gun 51. We're going to continue down this passageway to another ladder. Okay, we're going up this ladder, the gun spots in, that's right up here. What you see over here is a 5 inch 38 caliber gun. It's an anti aircraft weapon that was used aboard this ship in World War II. At that period of time, there were 12 of these guns. Currently, there are only four that are left. They've all been removed. If you'd like, I'd like to walk you over here to this bulkhead and show you a diagram of the gun crew's positions. This is the uh, gun platform, and on that platform, there are eight crew members. And on this side is the trainer. Over here is the pointer. And I'm going to show you what those two people do. As we go along, there are crew members out here on the deck, and those are the ones that get the ammunition from the bulkhead and pass it to the crew members that are up here on the gun platform. And we would like to show you how this person, the pointer, the trainer, and the first projectile man and loader, how what they do on this gun to prepare it for firing. This is the trainer's position. The trainer's the person who traverses a gun to the left and right, or right to left, and the way that he operates it is to crank these handles, and you should be able to see this gun moving towards my left, and we'll just go a little way so you get an idea of how the gun moves. This is in manual, and it's relatively slow, but the gun weighs 39,000 pounds. As you can see, I'm not working too hard to do that. However, when it's in automatic, it's under hydraulic power, and a gun will move 60 degrees per second in the traverse mode. Okay, this is a pointer's position. The pointer elevates or depresses the gun. I'm elevating it right now, and the purpose of him doing that is to get the elevation that's needed to fire at a target that's at a long distance away. He uses these sights. In it, there's a crosshair. When the crosshair is on the target, he will fire the gun using this electrical trigger. And we'll try to get a close of it for you. Okay. Now, if we, if we have a power failure, which means we wouldn't have any electric power, the operator here, the pointer, can depress this foot treadle and it will fire the gun manually so that the Navy has come up with a method that if power is lost we can still fire the gun. Okay, I've been handed this powder case by the powderman out on the gun sponson. I will take it, set it in the ammunition tray, it's being held in place by this spade, and now I'll pick up the projectile which is over here in the fuse setter, and place it over here in front of the powder case. And when that's in place, I'll pull this lever down, and this will ram the powder case and the projectile inside the breech, and now the gun's ready to fire. That firing is accomplished by using an electric firing mechanism or the foot pedal. This is a 5-inch projectile, and this is the kind that's used to fire an aircraft. The black nose that you see here contains what's called a proximity fuse, which is actuality is a unit in which after the projectile makes several rotations through the barrel when it's fired, opens up a plate and allows electrolyte to enter a battery. That produces just enough power to power a small radio. That radio sends out a signal at a specific frequency. When that signal touches a solid object, it bounces back to the projectile, makes an electrical impulse, 
and that explodes the projectile, causing shrapnel to fly out, and that's what hits the airplane. This projectile is not used to hit an airplane. While we're talking about airplanes, uh, one of the things you need to be aware of, even though this ship had a lot of armament, these five-inch guns were never used to bombard the shore or to fire another ship. That's not what a carrier was intended to do. These guns are just for self-protection from enemy aircraft that's attacking the carrier. The aircraft aboard carrying bombs and other types of equipment could do a much better job fighting another ship or dropping bombs on shore than this gun would. The intent of carriers are to carry airplanes to do their job, and these guns were not used like they would have been on a destroyer, a cruiser, or a battleship, which they were used then to fight other ships. The ammunition that you see here comes from a ready room through these portholes. They're closed right now, but the small ones are for the projectiles, and back here, the longer openings are for the powder cases, which are picked up and handed to the people on a gun platform. This gun is capable of firing as many rounds as you can load in it. It's not limited to the firing rate other than what the crew is able to load. Generally speaking, the average rounds per minute that can be fired is around 8 to 15 rounds. You're now in the ready room, and the ammunition is stored over on those racks. You can see the powder, two powder cases, and they're stacked up uh, to the height where that bar ends. And to the right of the powder is the projectile storage area, and they are stacked uh, in that compartment over there. And this is where the crew inside picks up that ammunition and brings it over to these doors that you see the X's on. This door is a short one. That's the one the projectiles are passed out to the area outside on the bulkhead, that, as you've seen out there. Here, the powder cases are placed through this bulkhead to the serving area outside. The ammunition as it's used up is replenished by this ammunition hoist which uh, brings ammunition up from the magazines, which are on the fifth deck. That's seven decks below here. The communication between the ammunition ready room and the magazine is done by sound-powered phones. We are now in the Combat Information Center, referred to as CIC. It is the heart of the Hornet's combat activities. The function of the CIC is to receive data from various sources, radar, sonar, aircraft, fire control, and visual and electronic support measures. All the information is processed by plotting time series on status boards or plotting tables. Summaries of all the relevant information is presented to the CIC officer and decisions are made to determine what actions to take both defensive and offensive. This console is used by the CIC officer and all of the combat activities are directed from here. The CIC officer stands on this raised platform where he can view all of the status boards. Some of the tools used to provide the CIC officer with needed information include the air intercept center which is shown here and this is used to direct a Hornet's fighter aircraft to intercept attacking aircraft. The rectangular scope are re radar repeaters which display the altitude of aircraft at a maximum range of 275 miles. The round radar repeater displays the range and compass bearing at a maximum range of 345 miles. The information from this radar repeater is plotted on the master air picture status board and it identifies all aircraft detected by radar. Decisions are based on these tracks since they indicate which targets are of greatest concern 
and which ones were within engagement range. Selected service targets may also be plotted. All of the displays are relative to the Hornet's actual heading, which is shown in the upper right-hand corner with the compass bearings. Target data was manually placed on the back of the status board and is most often shown in World War II movies with a seaman behind the board riding backwards. Over here is the Anti-Submarine Warfare or ASW plotting board. This surface target plotter automatically tracked the Hornet's position and four targets relative to the Hornet could be projected on the face of the surface target plotter. The source of the data for each target positioning adapter is selected from any of four radar repeaters, the sonar control room near the bow or the fire control director located on the fourth deck. Each contact would be manually plotted on the ASW status board and aircraft could then be vectored to that contact. Depth charges or sound guided torpedoes could be dropped in the contact area to attack the target. Over here is the Dead Reckoning Tracer or DRT and it's used to continually track the Hornet's position when in the open ocean. This DRT and the one in the navigation had to agree and were accepted as the Hornet's official position in the, in the ocean. Later in the tape we will more fully show the DRT in the navigation bridge and show how it functions. Enter through this door, you're entering into the largest crew quarter aboard the ship. This is just typical of the enlisted man quarters where they slept. And proceed through the crew quarters, this bulkhead to my right, and it extends to the port side. This compartment slept 254 people. The bunks were four high, and as you can see, they probably were not the most comfortable bunks in the world, but it's all that the sailors had, so they had to enjoy it. Over here is a locker that is typical of lockers that enlisted people had aboard ships while this ship was in commission up until 1970. Everything that the sailor owned had to fit inside that locker. Each sailor had a locker assigned to him and a little personal lockable drawer that they could keep their personal belongings in that are valuable like money, wristwatches and that sort of thing. We're going to proceed over here to the mid section of the crew quarters and in here you can see that the bunks just continue on and on and on uh, again making up a total of 254 and you have to kind of wind your way through to get out of this compartment and where we're going to head to next is down to the forecastle and that is coming up shortly where you will see the door and ladder that leads down to that area. It's straight ahead and through that door will be a platform that will be at the top of the ladder and we'll proceed down that into the forecastle and have a brief explanation of how and what happened up here down from the crew quarters and if we pursue on proceed on the uh, forecastle deck uh, you can see the kind of equipment that is contained in here there's an anchor chain and each one of those links weighs 120 pounds the chain is 1,100 feet long and is currently down in the chain locker where it's stored when the anchor is placed pulled up in front of the bow as you've seen it when you came aboard the units over here are called pelican hooks and this is a close-up of one. There are two of them. What those pelican hooks are doing is a safety guard to make sure these chains don't drop by themselves for whatever reason if they have a mishap on the brake mechanism. The, the anchor on this ship weighs 15 tons plus the weight of the chain as it goes out you can understand 
how much weight is actually being used to propel the anchor into the ocean when it's going to be anchored. This pelican hook, when it's released, they pull a safety pin, and then with a sledgehammer, they knock the lock off. The pelican hook comes loose and drops over there. And there's two of those, one this one and one over here. The chain right now with those released are being held by the chain brake, which is located over here. What you're viewing right here is the instrument that the telegraph orders down from the pilot house to weigh the anchor or release the anchor. Weigh the anchor means pulling it in, releasing of course is when they drop the anchor into the water. Each time that there's a change of command of orders to do one or the other, this bell is rung so that they know the orders are coming down. As you recall, we released the pelican hook, so the chains are just being kept in place by the brake. And that brake is operated by an individual that turns the wheel either to lock it or release it. Right now, it's in the lock position. When the orders are received from the pilot house, from that instrument on the bulkhead that we just looked at, and they receive the orders to drop the anchor or let go the anchor, they release the brake, and they do not do it real suddenly because they don't want this chain bouncing all over the deck as it is released with the anchor pulling it out. They control the drop of it here. And when the anchor reaches the bottom of the ocean or air bay where it's going to be anchored, the chain will slow down and then he'll lock this anchor again. With this wheel, it operates a wrist that that controls the motor that operates the wildcat over here that this chain right now you can see where it's fastened to or goes around. By operating this it revolves the wildcat and they use that to pull the anchor in and then the chain goes down into the chain locker. Some of you have probably heard or maybe even read about the ghosts that are aboard this ship. This forecastle is one of the areas where People say they have seen or heard strange sounds. See these two wrenches here? Twice there have been people that have witnessed when they've had meetings or some ceremony that's going on up here, but especially when they're telling ghost stories to the Boy Scouts and the youth groups that sleep aboard the ship, that uh, with the lights down low and as the story goes, one of these wrenches for all of a sudden mysteriously got thrown across the deck. And no one knows how or what removed this wrench from its container and how it got thrown onto the deck. This wrench weighs about 50 pounds, so it would take a pretty strong ghost to do that, wouldn't you think? As we leave the forecastle, we will now be entering the junior officer's quarters. More known as the boys' town because the officers that served aboard this ship that had these for their compartments were mostly ensigns. But as you can see, comparing this to the cruise quarters up above us, that uh, it's a lot more luxurious place. There's less people, the mattresses are thicker, there is more storage area for clothes, and it made it a little bit more of a comfortable existence for the officers when they are aboard. One of the things that we like to tell young people that are in here from school groups, as we show them the cruise quarters up on the other deck, we ask them to pay particular attention to those uh, bunks that are up there and that we're going to ask them to make a comparison when they come down here. When you get down here, the question is asked of them, that can, tell, can they tell the difference between these bunks and the ones up there and what would be the main difference. And of course they say the mattresses are thicker, there's further apart, the closets are bigger, but the main thing that we let them know is that there's four years of college. That's the difference. In addition to this sort of comfort that officers have in this particular area, they also have an area where they can put a curtain around and at night they can play cards 
And by placing a curtain around this area, the lights don't interfere with those officers that are sleeping. They could play cards here and uh, just in general tell sea stories to each other. You've now entered the auxiliary emergency diesel generator room, and there are two of these emergency generators aboard the ship. The purpose of these is to uh, provide power in case the steam generators get disabled. And later on, when we're in the engine room, you will see those steam generators. But for now, this is a Fairbanks Morse diesel engine. It has 20 cylinders, and it's connected to a shaft that revolves into this generator set, which produces electrical power of 1,000 kilowatts. That power that's produced will then be distributed to the control panel, which is this unit in this area. What the purpose of this is, and keep in mind, this is an emergency generator. This will not provide the entire power of any portion of the ship. It's used for the bomb elevators, for radar units, for the guns, the kinds of things that allow the ship to continue fighting and saving itself in battle. The crew slept in here. There are three bunks up here and three bunks down below. And in actuality, it might not seem like it, but this would be pretty good duty with your compartment that you live, sleep, and work in all in one spot. You don't have to go anywhere except to the mess hall to eat chow. We're going to go down another ladder to the lower portion to the lower portion of the engine so you can get a view of what it looks like down there. These are the other three bunks for the crew that worked and slept down here. And as you can see, it's exceptionally clean because these people that are stationed here keep it spotless. After all, it is their home. Over here is the lower portion of the diesel engine. These cylinders, were 20 of them, they're opposed. They're not side by side or in a, an angle like a V8 engine would be. These are 10 cylinders in the bottom, 10 at the top. And that's how the power is generated when the diesel is running. As we continue over here, you can see where the crew had some pretty nice accommodations down there. They had a sink and a drinking fountain, and I'm sure that when the ship was active, they probably had a hot plate down here where they could prepare their food, and it was pretty good duty down here. And it's one of the places that I'm sure other crew members would be envious of. We're back down on the hangar deck now, and you're looking at an F-14 Tomcat. If any of you are people that watch JAG on television, why this is the aircraft that the commander flies that uh, you see occasionally. And what we're going to do now is proceed down to the second deck, down this ladder, and we will be going into the officer's ward room. Which way, and we are now entering the officer's ward room, and this is the area where officers eight. This, the wardroom as you see it now is not like the ship was when it was active. These tables are round and the tables or the chairs you can see are up on the table. They do that to wax the floors. This room currently they use it for birthday parties and for various events that people want to have aboard ship and this is where they would be held. So this food was brought up from the galley which is down on the third deck. It was brought up by a dumb waiter that uh, would bring the food up and then we'd be placed in these steam trays that would keep it hot. As I mentioned in the beginning, in the early days, the officers would have their food served to them and the mess attendants would come in and pick up the food, put them on uh, trays and then take them into the officers. As time went on and the Navy became integrated, the officers in many cases have to serve themselves and that is what's currently being done on most of the big carriers. This is a uh, photo of the USS Hornet uh, among some other ships, and it, it provides a good example of what the flight deck looked like in World War II. If the aircraft were aboard were all propeller aircraft, and as you can see, it's a straight deck carrier. 
and it's, the straight deck is more emphasized on this photo over here, which was taken with an aerial view of about 1,500 feet by an aircraft, which gives you a perspective of what the flight deck looks like. And as you may or may not know, and we'll show a photo for you in a minute, that will show you what it looks like when it was converted to the angle deck carrier. This photo shows the Hornet in its final configuration, and this photo was taken off of Southern California in August of 1968. And you can see that the angle deck is very prominent now as compared to the straight deck carrier. You're now entering an officer's stateroom, and this stateroom would be assigned to officers that would be lieutenant commanders or even commanders, but certainly nothing, no officer that's below a lieutenant. There's only two bunks in here. There's a desk and a, very, and a large amount of storage space for their officer's uniforms. You work your way up in the ranks in the Navy that, that you do get some perks from it and this would be one of them as a lot more comfortable sleeping quarters. Room. The catapult room and this is the port catapult. This is used to catapult aircraft off of the flight deck during air operations. That's accomplished by utilizing air pressure and oil. And as you can see the containers where the air is stored uh, some of the spelling is probably not correct because that's supposed to be whiskey. But you know how southern sailors are, they probably just pronounce it whiskey. And I'm sure he must have been from Tennessee. So we continue down, the next one is vodka, rum, gin, and the big one down there is beer. The sailors, for whatever reasons, try to have some comedy in the operations of where they're working. As we turn this way, the hydraulic oil is in this container and air pressure is applied to it, which pushes this unit here called a bullhead. Up on the flight deck edge, there is a instrument and operators up there that are following the commands of the officer that is uh, directing the catapulting of the aircraft. Through hand signals, he will begin a series of exercises that uh, will close electrical switches and relay the information down to this area. The operators down here are duplicating it from the information they receive to make certain that there would be no errors made in the catapulting of an aircraft. Even to the degree that uh, there's a unit here that has a scroll on it. As the catapult is operated, that scroll draws a line. That line is measuring the hydraulic pressure that's applied to the catapult. And the purpose of that is if something should go wrong with the catapult uh, and a plane not make it off the flight deck for whatever reason, they can come back and look at that scroll and check to make certain that that may or may not have been the cause of the catapult failure. Over here is the bullhead that I mentioned earlier, and there is a hydraulic fluid and air pressure that pushes against this unit that you see that has all of these pulleys on it. Around those pulleys there are cables that are wound on it that eventually end up with the flight deck at the catapult shuttle. As this moves away from us or towards this end, the ratio of movement is 20. In other words, this bullhead will move 20 feet down here. Up on the flight deck, it will cause the shuttle to move 200 feet. And the speed that it acquires is also increased to the point where it will launch an aircraft from the flight deck from zero miles per hour to 120 miles an hour in 200 feet. Okay, we've left the catapult room and we're still on the third deck. We're going to proceed down this ladder to the fourth deck, and it's the ship's brig. The term brig, that's the jail aboard a Navy ship. And down here would be Marines that would be the guards, 
and the sailors that had done, or Marines, that had done something wrong that would warrant them to be placed in the brig would be behind this cell door, which is opened up. And if you'll come this way, you can see what the brig looks like. It's not a very pleasant place to be, but if uh, you haven't realized already, to be in the brig in the Navy during a period of time this ship was in commission is punishment. It's not rehabilitation. <laughs> but in any event, there are five cells in this brig and two bunks in each cell with the exception of one, and there are three of them in. There's even a solitary confinement cell that has a piece of sheet metal over the grill work so the prisoner cannot see outside. These bunks have no toilet, they have no water, and any time a sailor needs to use the facilities, he needs to get the marine guard to come in and escort him to the area. In fact, anywhere that a prisoner goes, even though he's aboard ship, he has to be escorted. That means to the mess hall, uh, to work, or whatever the case might be. We've just come out of the brig area, and now we'll be entering a flight to mess. This is the area where officers who were not in the uniform of the day would eat. The wardroom that we visited up the deck above us the officers had to be in the uniform of the day. That might be khakis, but it would be the uniform of the day. The people that ate down here would be pilots getting to go on a mission or pilots that had returned from a mission that would be in their pilot's uniform. In other words, they are not in the uniform of the day. And as the term was applied to this, it was called the dirty mess. What you're looking at on the deck is the marine emblem and this cage, so to speak, right above it or behind it. Uh, you can see the rifle rack right there and just above it is the USMC. That stands for the United States Marine Corps. And down here is an area where the Marines had a guard station. The purpose of the guard station being here is to guard the entrance to this door that you see here. This was an entrance to the area where they stored atomic weapons, down two decks below us on the fifth deck. And anyone that would be in this area that was not authorized to be in here might likely end up in the brig because this is a very, very restricted area. And this would be in the late 1960s when they carried those atomic weapons. This is a view down a passageway on the second deck. It almost is a mirror image as you look down through it, but each of those openings is a bulkhead. And as you can see at the bottom of those bulkheads, as well as the top, they do not go to the overhead or to the deck. The purpose of them not going to the deck, for example, like this one and the rest, is to provide strength for the bulkhead. Uh, not necessarily for keeping water out of these areas, as you'll see some of them do not have water-type doors. This one does, but all of them don't. The purpose of that is to provide strength for the bulkhead and also for the guys in the Navy to act as shin busters. That's what they're called. The correct name are combings, but the term shin busters and knee knockers was applied by the sailors because anyone that's been aboard a naval ship has scars to prove it. As we come down the passage on the second deck, we're now entering the Marine quarters. In here, there were 38 Marines that slept. They had their own bunks and uh, their own lockers. And as you can see, they're just about the same as the ones that up in the enlisted quarters up above the forecastle that we looked at. There's a space been developed here because this is an area where we use as a staging area for people as we're going down to the engine room. As you can see, along with this bunk as well as the ones up above, that you become very, very friendly with your bed partner because you're only about five inches apart. 
and this is true of all the enlisted quarter aboard ship. We're now entering the Marine's Lounge, which is just a short distance from the Marine Quarters. In here, as you can see to the right, is where the Marines stored their rifles, and on the top is where they kept their helmets. So in here they would be where the rifles and helmets were. As we proceed down through between these two lockers, we will now be entering the Marine's Lounge. In this area is where the Marines could play cards, drink coffee, and whatever else, whatever else uh, they could find uh, that was mischievous. The mural that you see painted on the bulkhead was painted by a Marine back in 1964, and it depicts the landing of the Marines on Tarawa. And you can see the alligator that used up on the beach, but uh, it's been here since, the, uh, since that date, and it's uh, still in good condition. I'm going, to proceed down, I'm going to proceed down this way, and we'll go into the next compartment, and this is where the non-commissioned officers slept. This would be like sergeants, and there were nine more bunks in here. For the period of time that the Marines were aboard this ship, from 1943, the day it went in commission, till it went out of commission, there were Marines that were aboard as a security force. Their purpose was to guard the quarter deck, escort the captain or the admiral when they were aboard to shore or to other ships as an armed guard. They also guarded the uh, atomic weapons storage area down below. They guarded the brig and the, the quarter deck to make sure that people that were leaving the ship had authorization to do so and also when they returned that they had the correct identification to come aboard ship. So the Marines had an important job. In the 90s, the Marines felt that their people needed more of the responsibilities of what the Marines were dedicated to, and that was to be part of the Marine Corps group. And the Navy then had to establish their own security force, which they currently have. The area where we're at right now is the passageway just at the entrance to the ship's hospital, or commonly called a sick bay. At uh, sick call, and it was usually 0800 in the morning, the sailors that felt like they needed attention due to illness would be lined up out here in this passageway. The corpsman would come out and give them a brief examination, and if they had a cut or an infection, they would be brought in and that would be taken care of. If you had an infection that would cause a temperature, and your temperature was over 101, more than likely you would be admitted to sick bay. And this is the area where they would do the blood work to test to find out what kind of infection you had that was causing the temperature rise, or it may have just been a flu. In the case of a flu, they would admit you to sick bay. If it was an infection, they would culture it and determine what kind of antibiotics they needed to treat it. As we continue down through here, we'll be going to the surgical ward where they would perform surgery aboard ship on people that uh, required it. For example, they could do epidectomy operations, and this would be the surgical ward right in here. It was a well-equipped hospital. And the operating table is there, and the equipment would be around here, stored in the cabinets whenever operations were performed. These lights up here, the large ones, are functional when we have electrical power aboard ship, and those are the lights we would use during surgery. However, if by chance we lost the electrical power from our generators, these lanterns up here, they're called battle lanterns. They have a battery in it that is continuously being charged when there is electricity. And they will provide a sufficient amount of light for the surgeon to complete his task. In fact, these battle lanterns are located throughout the ship. In those areas, it's for visual aid so you can see where you're going. Because when you get below decks with the doors and hatches closed, it is pitch black in these areas. If you were admitted to sick bay, this would be the area where you would be at. In here, it was pretty nice. 
nice soft bunks and if uh, you're quite sick or unable to leave the bunks to go to the mess hall the corpsman would bring your food trays to you and you can see how one is setting on this bunk where the food tray would be placed so that you could eat. But there are 48 bunks in this area and from the way that uh, you're treated in here you're treated as sick people because you are sick when you're in sick bay. This is the x-ray room and the way you see it right now is the way it was when we, we, we received the ship from the Navy. So the equipment in here has been sitting here since 1970 with the x-ray machine, the table, and the equipment that was used to determine if a person had a fractured arm or leg or whatever it might be. Okay, we're just outside of the sick bay and we're now going down to the fourth deck to the dental department and down this ladder to that area. You're now entering the dental department and in here there are a number of dental chairs, four of them to be exact, and the dentist would uh, repair, uh, fill teeth, uh, pull molars, do any dental work that was necessary to be done. Over here in the cabinet would give you a display of the tools that the dentist used in the performance of his work. There are uh, four dental chairs in this area. You just seen the one in the area where the instruments were at. This is another one. And we can back out and continue down the passageway to the next dental unit and that's similar. As you can see they were equipped quite well. In fact the chair and the instruments look pretty up to date. I've been in my own dentist and it's not much better than this one. We get down here to the next compartment and there is another dental chair which makes a total of four altogether. There is a x-ray machine in here where they can do the uh, x-rays of your teeth and right in that area with the black wall back there, or black bulkhead, that's where the x-rays were developed. This is the area where the technicians could make bridges, partials, false teeth, crowns, anything that was necessary to provide the people aboard ship proper dental care. This is one of the fog foam manufacturing stations that are located on this deck throughout the ship. What these were for is to manufacture foam that would be used to put out oil or gas fires. The fog foam would be pumped from these stations on up to the hangar deck and then clear up to the flight deck where more than likely if there were fires they would be related to gas and oil from the aircraft that were aboard. Manufactured by taking a 15 gallon can or container that were stored on these racks. From there they would take the container over to the station that you see here, drop that container on that knife edge and it would cut the can open. The material in that container would then run down into the fog foam manufacturing station. Now, you may not like to hear what I'm going to say about it, but the fog foam was manufactured by a mixture of animal blood and seawater. When it mixed and was agitated, it would foam, and that's what they would use to put out the fires in those days. Today, the foam is not manufactured that way. It's done with a detergent material, which is a lot cleaner, smells a lot better, but this was, and was used and it satisfied its purpose for that period of time that this ship was in commission. We're now entering the cruise head, which many of you may want to be termed as a washroom or water closet. And in here, as you can see, are the uh, basins that uh, the sailors would use to wash, shave with. The mirrors, some of the mirrors are still here. But uh, one of the interesting things about the enlisted crew head is the method that was used to reduce the number of newspapers they had to have aboard ship. And if you will look in this 
compartment here to both sides, you'll see there are no doors on the toilets. So the person on my right could read the front page and the person on my left can read the back page. <laughs> we'll continue over this way. In this section there are showers uh, and as you can see there's uh, five stalls and of course there'd be a sailor in each one showering and they did not have curtains on them so uh, this would be an area that uh, you need to be a little bit careful about how much water you splashed on the deck because it was unfortunate they'd have to clean up their own mess. What you're seeing here is a step down transformer and as you can hear it's quite noisy so we're going to back away from it a little bit so that you can hear me talk about it. These transformers are located all over the ship and the purpose of those is to reduce the electrical power coming aboard from 440 volts down to 120 volts for the lighting system therefore the name step down transformer. A lot of the electric motors aboard ship use 440 volts and require that much for the size of the motors that are used. But as you can see also throughout the ship, there's a lot of places where they use 120 volts like you would at home with lights, small fans and that sort of thing. The ship is the ship's library and it's just been completed. So as you can see, there are not uh, many books in the book cabinets, but eventually they will be completely filled. This is where the crew would come down to relax, read books, study for various examinations they would have to increase their ratings. But also, it's used as the ship's chapel, where the chaplain will be at that podium and conduct services in this area. And every Sunday morning, every this is the chief petty officer's of mess room and this is the galley where the food was prepared and as you can see everything is stainless steel the big pots were used to make soup or cook beans with this is the serving counter and a chief would walk to here with the tray and then come to this area where he would sit down and enjoy his meal the third deck now we're going to proceed down into the engine room we have two ladders to go down and I'll proceed down ahead of you down in the forward engine room and the reason that it's called a forward engine room because it's the engine room that's the closest to the bow of the ship which is over in this direction about 400 feet forward of us and if we'll pan over here to this engine here you can identify a name on the uh, low pressure steam line that's coming into it and her name is Shirley. Shirley uh, was probably stenciled there 45, 50 years ago. Who knows how long it's been there. Down in the forward engine room, there are two engines, Shirley, and the engine that's over on the port side, and it also has a name. Its name is the Big Twister. The engine room are the two outboard shafts on the ship. As we go aft, beyond this bulkhead, there are two more engines in the after engine room. Those engines are the inboard shafts. Now the construction of these engines in relationship to the boilers that provide the steam is that forward of us, on the other side of this bulkhead, there are two boilers and they are, they are the boilers that provide the steam for Shirley. On the port side there's two more boilers that provide the steam for the big twister. As we go aft, there are two more boilers for each of those engines, so totally we have eight boilers, four steam turbine engines, and four propellers. Each propeller is controlled by the engine that the shaft from that engine runs to, so each propeller and each engine are independent from the others. And if we take a look at this throttle wheel right here, the one I'm revolving, this is the throttle wheel that will increase the speed of the ship by providing more steam to the 
high pressure turbine which revolves the shafts faster. If I close it up, it reduces the steam going in there which of course slows the ship down. This other throttle wheel over here is used to reverse the engine so that the ship can back up. Each time there is a speed change or if they put the need to put the ship in reverse, up on the bridge in the pilot house they have a bell that uh, signal that rings this bell down here and every time they make a speed change that bell will ring so it'll alert the throttleman that there is a speed change coming down. And to do that, if you might recall when we were up on the bridge, showed you the lee helm. The lee helm is a unit that telegraphs the speed that they want the ship to operate. And when that handle is moved up there, it moves this small arrow that you see here. And the operator here will match it up, move this lever, and that tells the bridge that this engine received the information. Each of the other engines is also receiving that same information. Now, on the Hornet, standard speed is 15 knots. And there is a chart up here that indicates that at 15 knots, we need a, a revolutions of 111 revolutions per minute on each of the four propellers. Now, standard speed is relatively easy to control from the standpoint the information comes to the bridge, from the bridge, down here and the air would point to standard. The throttleman would then open or close the throttle to obtain 15 knots, which would be 111 revolutions per minute. That would be indicated on the RPM gauge right here. These gauges are stuck so the figures are not correct. If we were going 15 knots it would be about right in there, 111 revolutions per minute, which is great. However, if we want to maintain 15 knots and for if we have a uh, 20 knot wind blowing against the bow, you'd obviously need to provide more steam to maintain 15 knots. So what happens on the knot indicator which shows the speed of the ship, it'll start slowing down. Up on the bridge then they have a duplicate of this instrument and they can put in the revolutions per minute on this top line that they want the propellers to turn. Each engine has one of these units also. The operator will match those numbers up and then the throttleman will either open or close this throttle in order to get the RPMs that the ship is asking for. The ship can determine the number of knots that it's moving because down in the bottom of the hull on the outside there's a unit that's called a log. In that is a unit where a wheel revolves that indicates the speed of the movement of the ship through the water. And that is then sent up to the bridge in various areas throughout the ship. So if they need to increase the RPMs or decrease them, to maintain those 15 knots. They can continuously change this instrument from up in the pilot house until they get the speed that's required. Now, the particular panel that you're looking at right now, as you can see, contains the RPM gauge for all the engines. This one is for this engine that we're looking at now. This is for the one that is behind us. This one is also behind us on the port side and engine number four is the one that's on this same deck over on the port side. The purpose of all these gauges, and as you look across, you can see there's gauges here for boiler pressures. There are also gauges over here for steam temperatures. When the ship is functioning, there will be lights in this area and over here, which would indicate water levels. And this would indicate up here the amount of air pressure inside of the boilers. That air, by the way, provides the air for the fuel oil to burn when the boilers are operating. This, this particular station uh, is where the engineering officer is stationed, and he can determine how the boilers are operating and how the, the other engines are working because he has all the gauges here necessary for him to do that. By now, I'm sure you're somewhat interested in the knowing, well, how do we get this ship operating? Well, first of all, the ship requires steam to run the turbines, and we need water to make the steam. So on this ship, you could never carry enough water to satisfy the needs of the engine or the boilers. 
So how that's done is that there is water that's pumped aboard and goes up into a unit called the evaporators. Those evaporators will provide the ship with pure water, which is necessary because all the salt and minerals need to be removed. Well, not quite all, but it's about 0.2 parts per million, which is not... This, instru this instrument that you see here is where they measure the amount of salt content that's in the water, and then there's one that's down lower, and that measures the mineral content. The reason for removing the salt and minerals is if there was salt in the steam, it would corrode the whole system. With minerals, it would tend to build up on the pipes on the inside and reduce the efficiency of flow of the steam to the various units. The pure water then is pumped from the evaporators over to the feed tank. The feed tank is the tank that contains the water that will supply the boilers with the water that's required to produce the steam for the engines. When the feed tank is full, and by the way it holds 148,000 gallons of water, when it's full there's an overflow into the potable water tank and that's the water that the crew drinks take showers with and also is used to cook the meals. The uh, water then from the feed tank is pumped into the boilers. In the boilers there is what's called a burner tube. In that burner tube there is standard Navy Bunker C fuel oil that has been heated so it's thin enough to be sprayed into the burner tube. When it's sprayed in it uh, will burn when it's ignited because it has a proper air fuel mixture. As it burns it creates a great deal of heat. The fire goes up through the pipes and through which the uh, water from the feed tank is being pumped. Similar to a water heater that you have at home that rather than the fire going up through the center of your water heater tank, this goes up through tubes in which the water is flowing. There are two stages to each boiler. The first one heats the water up to 450 degrees at 600 pounds pressure per square inch. As it goes to the second stage, it now heats steam, and that's heated up to 850 degrees, still at 600 pounds pressure per square inch, and that steam is called superheated steam, and that is what operates the high pressure turbine. As we follow along over here, this is the main opening and closing valve for the steam line that comes from the boiler. And if we open it, then the steam comes through this pipe, the main steam line, and comes around over here and goes behind the main control panel. And you can get a view of the high pressure turbine, which is a unit that you can see back here. As the steam goes through the main steam line, it comes to that vertical pipe that goes into the high pressure turbine. And as, I, as the operator here, the throttleman, revolves this gray bar, you can see the gears revolving. But well, what that's doing is opening up the throttle plate, which lays across here, and it opens it up and allows the steam to come down into the high pressure turbine. The purpose of the gears and spring is to allow the throttleman to open that throttle plate because with 600 pounds pressure per square inch on that throttle plate, it would be physically impossible to move it without the mechanical advantage that the gears and spring provides. Steam now comes down to the main steam line, this vertical pipe, down into a high pressure turbine. And if we run the ship as fast as it will go, we, which will revolve this turbine at 5,000 revolutions per minute when the throttle plate is wide open, and this little turbine is about four foot long and about three feet in diameter, but it will produce 18,750 horsepower. Now the steam then that's left over from that comes up through the crossover pipe and down into the low pressure turbine, which is this unit right here. Now this turbine is over twice the size of the high pressure turbine the pressure is down to about 60 pounds over here, but it revolves about 4,400 RPMs, but again, it'll produce 18,750 horsepower. So there are, the total of these engines would be 37,500, 
and there are four of them all together. So we get 150,000 horsepower with all four engines running, which they normally do. And at full horsepower, it would drive this ship in World War II at 33 knots, and that's 38 miles an hour. Pretty fast. Out of the high-pressure turbine, there's a shaft, and if I follow around over this way, there is another shaft that comes out of the low-pressure turbine, and that's this one right here. Both of those shafts go into this double reduction gearbox, which acts like a transmission would on a car, which slows the revolutions per minute coming from the turbines that would go out to the propeller. For example, if we tried to run that propeller with the full RPM coming off of the turbines at 5,000 RPM, we'd probably tear the whole ship apart. So this slows it down to a maximum of 252 revolutions per minute. And there is a shaft that runs down the center of this gearbox, and there's a big bull gear down at this end. That bull gear is attached to a shaft that goes out to the propeller, which is 226 feet beyond this bulkhead. You can see that uh, red and white striped shaft below us. That's the shaft that, that is the shaft that goes out to the propeller. And that comes out of the double reduction gearbox that slows it down to a maximum of 252 revolutions per minute. Now remember that shaft is 226 feet long. It's 20 inches in diameter with a 13 inch core, so it's hollow. The propeller is 15 feet in diameter and weighs 27,000 pounds. And there are four of those, and that's what moves the ship when it's underway. You may have noticed that we're down in the engine room that there are an awful lot of electrical wires that run along the bulkheads. And we'll explain the purpose of those in just a minute because they supply the power that's required around the ship. What you're looking at right now is a steam-powered electric generator. This is the turbine and it operates similar to the engines and there's a shaft that comes out of the turbine into this large generator. There are four of these aboard ship. Each one will produce 1,250 kilowatts of electrical power, a total of 5,000. The power that's by the generators goes to the big distribution panel that's back here and from there it's distributed to the ship where it's required and that's the purpose of all the electric wires down here. Currently, there are 440 volts coming in from the pier. The power comes to this distribution panel and then it's distributed to the rest of the ship. And in the areas where we're only using 120 volts, there are step-down transformers that reduce the electrical power down to 120 volts for the lighting system. And we're gonna enter the cruise mess. And of course, this is the area that's uh, true and dear to all good sailors because you fill up and get your rations down here so you can continue to work hard and do your duty aboard ship. Go straight out and then proceed into the galley and in here you lay your tray on the counter and inside there are some steam trays to which the food is kept hot and the mess attendant inside will scoop out whatever's there, potatoes, gravy, uh, meatloaf, uh, vegetables, and that, and the food that you're going to get from the hot area, place it on the tray. And as you move down, there are additional areas where additional food is put on to where you go to the end of it, and down there is where you get your bread, cake, pie, or whatever dessert they might have, and a good many times it's just jello. Back over here are the big electric ovens in which they can bake or roast uh, the food that uh, they use in here. For example, Thanksgiving turkeys, hams, or just plain old moot loaf, or even cakes. And proceeding down over here, this area are electric. Oh, by the way, all these are electric. And the electric stoves where they can cook food on the top. And as you proceed and look over to your left, you can see some big round pots. Those are heated by steam, and that's where they prepare the beans and soup and rice and that sort of thing. You're now in the mess hall, and this is where the crew would eat. And 
keep in mind this ship in World War II fed about 2,000 people down here. There's this mess hall and then one directly behind us that's in that darkened compartment. But uh, so you're aware of the kind of equipment they had down here. These are not the tables and chairs that they used when this ship was active. The kinds of tables they had were fold-up tables and also the bench-type seats that folded up also. They were not fastened to the deck. 